Live from news up here at Desawe in Kanda. This is News 360. My name is Alfred Okanse. And I'm Aisha Yakubu. A look at the headlines this evening. News 360 headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paint, Piccadilly Biscuits, and My Life Insurance. Media industry players kick against drafts policy on conditional asset system on digital terrestrial platform which will require viewers of free-to-air digital channels to pay for the service. Minority in Parliament accuses government of reckless borrowing, making Ghana with a public debt stock of close to 200 billion cities, one of the highest debt distress risk countries in the world. Also, mortuary workers call off strike. And uh, African Union suspends Sudan membership with immediate effect amid an upsurge of violence in the capital that has seen dozens killed on the international front. Bring you details of these and more tonight here on News 360. Remember, we're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, on DSTV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. So very first story, police are searching for two Canadian nationals who were abducted by some unknown persons at about 8.25 p.m. on Tuesday, June 4, around the Royal Golf Club at Ahojo in Kumase. A statement signed by the Director General of the Police, Public Affairs Department, ACP David Clue, indicated the two victims aged 19 and 20 are volunteers with an NGO known as Youth Challenge International based in Ghana. Investigations have kick-started after the complaint and the security agencies are working assiduously to rescue them and get the perpetrators arrested. The police are urging the general public to assist by volunteering information to the security agencies. Meanwhile, the Canadian government has issued a letter to its citizens in Ghana to step up their personal security following Tuesday's kidnapping. The government on Thursday, June 6, issued a fresh violent crimes alert for Ghana, stating armed robbery and kidnapping may occur. It also cautioned them to beware of their surroundings and avoid walking alone or displaying signs of wealth. Ensure that windows and doors in your residence are secured, the Canadian government tweeted on June 5. It has since June 6 updated its security and safety alert on Ghana on its official website to include the latest information. Uh, getting some information that the driver of the said vehicle and these two nationals were kidnapped into has been arrested. We'll keep an eye on this and update you on our subsequent bulletins. But media industry players have kicked against the communication ministry's draft policy on conditional access system on the digital terrestrial platform, which will require that viewers of free-to-air digital channels pay for the service. The roadmap to migrate the country from analog to digital television transmission after having missed the 2015 international deadline. An estimated 99% of Canadians exclusively rely on the free to air digital stations to access information. The Communication Ministry's draft policy on digital terrestrial television features a conditional access encryption system. Under the system, viewers of free-to-air channels would pay to access services. At a broadcasting media industry forum, participants described the draft policy as a threat to media freedom and the practice of journalism. The ministry's move to encrypt free-to-air television is an affront to media independence and freedom and a denial of the individual's right to information. Our constitution guarantees the freedom and independence of the media, the individual's right to information, and the responsibility of the media to hold government accountable to the people of Ghana. Since the advent of the Fourth Republic, these rights and responsibilities have been tested in diverse ways, including decisions by law courts and today our law reports are replete with judicial pronouncements upholding the freedom and independence of the media. The draft policy document 
which has finally been raised only after several agitations and similar forum in the past seem to be infested with undesirable septic shocks that will send the broadcasting industry into terminal coma should implementation be allowed without questions. The Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association and other key broadcast stakeholders have expressed discomfort about the draft policy on many grounds. Among others, that the MOC move to encrypt free-to-air television as an affront to media independence and freedom and a denial of the individual's right to information. Executive Director of the Media Foundation for West Africa, Suleiman Abraima, requested wider consultation of all stakeholders with the Ministry of Communication on the draft policy. I certainly believe that it is something that requires a lot of consultation, a lot of engagement, which as far as I can understand, the ministry is not doing. Yes, the ministry may have the power to set policies, the ministry may have power to, to, to take certain decisions, but at the end of the day, those decisions are being taken on behalf of the people and on behalf of the industry. The Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, GIBA, has also expressed concern about government having control of the body that will oversee the country's digital terrestrial technology. Now, the minority in parliament has accused the akufuado led government of reckless borrowing, contrary to its 2016 campaign promise not to borrow when it assumed power. At a news conference in Accra, spokesperson on finance, Kessel Atoforsen, said Ghana's public debt stock of close to 200 billion CDs makes it one of the highest debt distress risk countries in the world. The minority caucus in parliament noted the latest report on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of Ghana taking into account the current debt stock at the end of the first quarter of 2019. The Minority Caucus is deeply concerned about the recklessness or reckless borrowing of the NPP government. This extent of borrowing marks a betrayal of trust reposed in the president after he and his then vice presidential candidate promised in, in opposition not to borrow because, according to them, we had all the resources needed to finance our development. Not only has the president's insatiable appetite for borrowing exposed that promise as hollow, it also shows that he and his team do not pro uh, possess the competence they claim to have to generate the domestic revenue to finance the national budget. According to Kesalato Force and the figure represents an increase of about 80 billion cities in the last 27 months of the President Akufuado's administration. Government's attitude, he lament, is a blatant abuse to the rebasing of the economy. The government issuance calendar for the second quarter of this year shows that another 12.1 billion will be borrowed with a net amount of 566 billion Ghana cities being added to the public debt. Our estimate based on this trend is that the public debt will rise to about 250 billion in a year by this time. This is an addition of 130 billion Ghana cities as against what they inherited. So they will end up adding more than what Ghana um, as a country had as public debt before they took over. At the current exchange rate levels, the minority said borrowing alone had given President Akufado's administration a staggering $16 billion over the period. The minority further gave a breakdown of the figures. There are foreign denomination aspects. So you are owing 6,827 Ghana cities. But the majority has described the news conference as much ado about nothing. What is the debt to GDP ratio? It's still below 60%. They had it at almost 73.4%. So don't talk about that. Apart from that, what are our friends in the NDC are refusing and confusing Ghanaians, of which we have to educate Ghanaians, is the fact that when they were borrowing recklessly, GDP was going down. You know what GDP is? It is the outcome of whatever you do, all the economic activities. So if you borrow and then you use the money responsibly, GDP should be rising. Look at ours. Responsible borrowing. GDP and borrowing have positive relationship. As you borrow and you invest properly, your GDP, which is production, begins to increase. So why do you call it reckless? I think it's much ado about nothing. They don't have much to do.
Let's just stay with the NDC, shall we? The women's wing of the party is requesting President Kofuado to uh, render an apology to Ghanaians, particularly women, over what they describe as controversial comments made in Canada about Ghanaian women. At a news conference in Accra, the party's national women's organizer, Dr. Anna Bissu, noted such comments were an embarrassment to the country. President Okufuado, in his contribution at the Women Deliver Conference in Canada, said he is yet to see dynamism in Ghanaian women, a comment which have been heavily criticized. However, Information Minister Kojo Ponkuma has said, contrary to trolls that President Okufuado has not done enough to amplify women, his track record shows the contrary. National Women's Organizer of the NDC, Dr. Hanabisi, said, the comments by the president is an indication of how less knowledgeable he is when it comes to issues related to gender, especially women empowerment. Mr. President, you have embarrassed Ghanaian women in no uncertain terms on a global stage. You have insulted us, Mr. President. You need to redeem yourself and render an unqualified apology. Dr. B.C. said the president should have used the occasion to amplify the achievements of Ghanaian women and what his administration is doing for them. It is pathetic to see that all President Akufuado could do was to feign ignorance about the implicit role required by men to create opportunities without apology for capable Ghanaian women and close the massive gender gaps that are doing nothing to move development in this country forward. A worst case scenario would have been to highlight his own efforts and his administration to enhance women empowerment in Ghana. She also challenged the president to make his academic credentials public for comparison. Mr. President, these women in Ghana, we are going to put forth our academic credentials, the grade with which we graduated, are these documents, and we are challenging you, Mr. President, who says that there is no woman capable, able in Ghana to sit around a decision-making position. Mr. President, you are the first gentleman of our country, so you make decisions for us. So we want to know your academic credentials. On the issue of the three kidnapped Takradi girls, the NDC says it would not relent on its efforts at ensuring that the girls are located. Meanwhile, gender activist and former gender minister Nana Oye Litha has also criticized the president over his comments challenging him to justify the 2017 AU Gender Champion Award he won. Gender minister Nana Oye Litha said the president's comments are a disappointment. I was shocked and I wept for Ghana. I wept for Ghana because if the president of Ghana is saying this, then where are we? I believe that President Nana Adodankwa Akufuado, he disappointed African women being the AU gender champion and also deeply disappointed not only Ghanaian women but the people of Ghana at large. She explained the president's opinion was rather stereotypical, despite he being an accomplished human rights lawyer. I believe that this provides an opportunity for us to explain and clarify to the people of Ghana that women have rights. At the end of the day, we are saying that he, as president of Ghana, should provide opportunities for women in Ghana, should ensure that there's an even playing field. She challenged the president to justify the 2017 AU Gender Champion Award he won. Let's still stay with uh, Nano Yelitha because she was a former gender minister and she's advocating a real look at strategies in addressing the issues of female genital mutilation. She was speaking after a review of uh, the documentary Apostles of Pain. <laughs> The documentary Apostles of Pain highlights the spate of female genital mutilation at Puziga in the Upper East region despite it being criminal in Ghana. 
the practice though widespread in the region is being done in secrecy particularly at the border town of Pusiga close to Togo and Burkina Faso the gender ministry has declared a zero tolerance of the practice but girls as young as five are still being cut in the area while others are transported across the border to Togo and Burkina Faso to undergo female genital mutilation. It's during vacation. You didn't want to do it yourself or because tradition demands? They say that they are doing it. Me too, I say I should do, I will do some. Practitioners now consider it a business instead of the usual traditional belief. Those days, the people will mobilize themselves in the community and they invite us. Then now because of the issue of the arrest, they themselves rather hide, bring the children for us to do. Uh, this year alone, how many children have you circumcised? Hundred there about. During a review of the investigative piece on New Day, the former gender minister Nana Oyelitha said it is a wake up call. There's a need for us to relook really at our strategies to stop the practice because the practice is adverse to the reproductive health of the woman. We have issues of fistula, incontinence of urine and feces, mm. and difficulties when these women um, give birth, and, and several other complications. So this is a wake-up call. This documentary, congratulations. The United Nations Population Fund country representative to Ghana Niyi Ojolape is of the view more needs to be done on the issue. There is a case of continually, I mean, spreading the word in terms of communication, publicity in the area so that the people can be convinced first. And secondly, the people who are doing it as a business, it is their practitioner, that's what they've always known as their source of livelihood. We need to find something else for them to do. An estimated 200 million females have undergone some form of female genital mutilation, according to the United Nations. Away from that, chairman of the governing New Patriotic Party, Freddie Blay, could be committed into prison custody for disobeying a lawful request by the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice. He is facing contempt charges with the commencement of committal proceedings in an Accra High Court on Friday, June 7. The following news desk report chronicles events which have led to the committal proceedings. In the run-up to the new Petrochi Party NPP Delegates Conference last year, the then acting chairman of the party, Freddie Blay, promised to provide the bus each for the 278 constituency branches to be used for commercial purposes. The buses, he said, were to be supplied before the party's national executive elections that took place on July 7 last year. This raised a number of queries where he was accused of vote buying, an accusation he denied. Subsequently, the Coalition for Social Justice petitioned the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice Raj to investigate him in connection with the procurement of the buses. According to reports, Freddie Blee has consistently failed to respond to several requests from the Commission, reason Shraj has proceeded to the High Court with contempt charges against him. On the motion on notice for the contempt proceedings, Shraj prayed the court for an order to commit Freddie Blay into prison custody for disobeying his lawful request. According to the motion on July 6, 2018, Shraj received a complaint from the Coalition of Social Justice requesting the commission to investigate the NPP chairman for corruption. The commission, after assessing the complaint, came to a conclusion that it had the mandate to investigate the matter. The motion stated on August 20, 2018, Shraj wrote to the respondent to submit his comments on the allegation within 10 working days unless he admits to the allegations. The said letter was delivered to Freddie Blee, but he failed or refused to oblige the commission with his comments as requested even upon several reminders. A subpoena dated January 21 for the respondent to produce certain documents before it by Monday, January 28, was also ignored. 
On our MTA video report today, our citizen journalist Safura Ibrahim reports on the ripping off of the roof of the Methodist Basic School Block at Ukrase in the Kyopim North District of the Eastern Region and requests authorities to re roof the building. On 21st March, a heavy rainstorm ripped off our school's roof. Currently, the JHS 1 and 2 students are at home, and the JHS 3 students have been moved to an uncompleted building where they are studying. We are pleading with the authorities to come to our aid. My name is Ibrahim Safura. In the JHS 3, at the Okrasi Methodist BJHS in the Grappenmouth District. You can also send your video report via WhatsApp number 055-1433-044. You're watching News 360 this morning. After this break, please stay with us. Uh, welcome back. Park with your sorry is standing by with business. Pa, what's happening? Well, Alfred, we've got a lot coming up for you tonight. We've got news in the oil and gas sector as well as in the banking industry. So let's begin with the oil and gas industry where expect uh, Ishmael Jacobine wants the energy ministry to learn the necessary lessons from the just ended bidding process for the new oil blocks. He says if that is not done, future exercises might suffer. The Petroleum Revenue Management Act was followed by the Petroleum Commission Act 2011, Act 821, which established an independent regulatory body, the Petroleum Commission of Ghana. The Local Content and Local Participation Regulations 2013, LI 2204, followed in 2013 to ensure that the expertise, goods and services of Ghanaians are employed or engaged in most petroleum-related activities. The PNDC Law 84 was replaced in August 2016. Ghana launched the first open and competitive bidding round in October 2018, replacing the previous direct negotiation process. Despite the open bidding process, the Energy Ministry received about 16 applications for direct negotiation. Oil and gas expert Ismail Ejikumene says, although the open bidding process is welcome, the various concerns raised must be addressed by the Energy Ministry. The whole idea behind the, the the competitive bidding should be encouraged. Even if there are flaws, let's learn from what we, we, we have done this first round and, and see how we can make it better. Business magnate Daniel McCauley says the country can only reap the benefits from oil production if oil contracts are negotiated appropriately. We need to have good negotiators. We need to polish our negotiation skill. Immediately you have good negotiators, you have we have a plan, and I believe um, uh, we have we have very smart and educated people in government. But I would I would beg of them to think the business side. Normally, at times you need to have a, a little bit of the business smartness to be able to negotiate some of these uh, serious uh, facilities. He is of the view that if the terms of contracts remain unfavorable, the expected development associated with oil and gas production would not be realized. All right, in other news, MTN Ghana has unveiled a new logo to mark 10 years of its mobile money service in Ghana. The general manager in charge of mobile financial service at MTN, Eli Haney, says the brand is proud to have broken barriers in achieving financial inclusivity and simplifying financial transactions. MTN Mobile Money, popularly called Momo, is a fast, simple, convenient, secure and affordable way of transferring money, making payments and other transactions using a mobile phone. MTN offers the service through its platform supported by its partner banks. General Manager in charge of Mobile Financial Service at MTN, Eli Hini, revealed plans of using the platform to accelerate the development of a unified financial ecosystem, especially in the informal sector. When we started, most people didn't know what we were talking about. And it would have been very easy for it to have been left to die naturally. Today, most people use mobile money for various things. People are also able to borrow. 
for emergencies, short term, 30 days, you borrow, you pay back. People are able to invest in treasury bills. People are able to invest in their future, pensions. I mean, without mobile money, this wouldn't have been possible to the common person. Yes, the formal processes would have been there, but how many people does it touch? For those who have been financially excluded, mobile money has now included them. And with mobile money, they are able to save money. He promised customers several exciting promotions within the year. We still need our customers to understand that you cannot give your pain out to somebody. You have given him access. It's just like opening your door. You cannot also give your phone to someone to do transaction for you. Learn how to do it. It's simple. And when you give it to someone, you've given the, the, the pin to that person because you don't know what he will do before he gives the phone back to you. Somebody has called you. You have won promotion. You didn't take part in any promotion. How can you win? MTN Mobile Money can be used to send and receive money, top up airtime, pay utility bills, buy airline tickets, settle school fees, and more. You can register for the service by presenting a valid identification card at any MTN office or registered vendor nationwide. In other news, Yango, a ride hailed app, has been launched in Accra, making Ghana the second after Cote d'Ivoire to open the service in Africa. Its unique technology ensures very affordable prices for rides while lowering commission payable by drivers. Ghana's inclusion brings to 15 number of countries operating the service across the globe. It has 36 million users and 900,000 drivers connected to the service worldwide. Rides ordered with the Yango app starts from as slow as two cities including car arrival fee and five minutes of the ride. The Yango app uses a stack of machine learning based technologies to optimize other processes like support service operations, which reduce the net cost of the ride better than other services. General Manager of Yango in West Africa, Kadushian Soro, explained that Yango app provides fast delivery of cars and several cars can be ordered at once. Yango is the right hailing hub. Not just another ride hailing hub, but the ride hailing hub. And we are here to, how to say, to improve the lives of Ghana, Accra people and Ghanaians in general. So we'll start in Accra and if it works well for us, we might be expanding in over, in over cities across Ghana. We have affordable prices, I would say unbeatable prices. And we also save time for users and drivers so that they can save on their fuel and be more efficient. Senior international launcher of Yango, Adeniyi Adebayo, noted the app allows the user to rate each ride and send feedback to the support service. And using all of these smart algorithms and in terms of you know, uh, distribution of orders, it allows us to reduce idle time that drivers waste just burning fuel. Now by doing that, they can do more rides and make more money. Uh, for riders, because we're using our own technologies, we don't rely on uh, outside technologies for our mass or our navigation systems, it makes it possible for our riders to get cheaper fares while not necessarily totally reducing the, uh, the income of the drivers. The Yango service is operated by Yandis, one of the largest IT companies in Europe that builds intelligent products and services powered by machine learning. Well, that's all for the business news segment here on News 360. Thanks for making a date with us. My name is Park Asari. For more business news stories, you can log on to our website, www.3news.com. Over to you, Alfred. Thank you, Park with business. Let's get into the mortuary workers. Now, the Association of Ghana is saying that they've called off its industrial strikes. The mortuary workers have been on strike over low wages and poor conditions of service. According to the statement from the Association of Mortuary Workers, the strike was called off following the overwhelming and desperate pleas of the general public and what they described as multiple disastrous health implications. He further also stated, though the Ministry of Health and Fair Wages and Salaries Commission has so far not shown much commitment to addressing their problems, the Mortuary Workers Association is once more urging the leadership and goodwill by calling off its strike. The association says it has also gone ahead to reduce most of its demands so as to further facilitate negotiation. The strike is being called off and they are ready to enter into negotiation 
to put a definitive end to this desperate effort to have its really bad working conditions and environment improved. Yeah, well, aren't we black and proud? <laughs> we all are. Yeah. My name is <laughs> Alfredo Kansi. On behalf of the rest of the team, we'll say thank you. And I am black and proud. My name is Aisha Yakubu. I'm black and proud. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good evening.